Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for our talk on Gen AI for Neurodiversity. Before I begin, I always like to start with a show of hands. So I would love to know how many of you have heard the word neurodiversity or neurodivergence. Oh my god, this is an enlightened audience, which means my second question is redundant, but it was going to be how many of you have never heard the term neurodiversity. But thank you so much. Thanks for your responses. Oh, fantastic. We have one. So I have an audience of one today is what it looks like. Oh, we've got two. Thank you. <laughs> Super. So my name is Manisha Mehta, my pronouns are she and her, and I lead the disability inclusion efforts for Amazon and for AWS for all markets outside the US. Um, I started kind of working on disability inclusion about seven years ago, and as I interacted with members of the community, I did learn that one of the biggest barriers in this space is lack of awareness and understanding on disability inclusion, which is why I started moving my kind of career graph into disability inclusion strategy, disability inclusion frameworks, disability inclusive culture. And I'm using the word disability inclusive to include neurodiversity as well. And as luck would be, two years ago, my then six-year-old daughter was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. And I think her kind of traits and her diagnosis have, in, have given me a lot of insights about me so I'm the one who has 20 tabs open at any given point in time. I'm working, actively working on drafting three emails and reading two books at the minimum at simultaneously. So that's a little bit about me. But let's move into what we're going to cover at lightning speed for you in the next 20 minutes. We'll speak about what is neurodiversity to what does it actually mean when we say neurodiverse or neurodivergent. I'll also try and cover very briefly some insights and st statistics around neurodiversity. And then we will dive into Matthew's part of the presentation, which is essentially on how does Gen, Gen AI enable, empower, and equalize the world for neurodivergent individuals, and hopefully for all of you in your workplaces. So let's jump right in. What is neurodiversity? So neurodiversity is a term that was coined by an Australian sociologist, Judy Singer, in 1998, when she observed similarities between social interactions or challenges in social interactions that her mother faced, and she started observing the same in her daughter as well. And that is when she coined the term to recognize the fact that neurodiversity is a natural variation in the way we think, act, and communicate. So it is a natural variation of our mind. It is not you know, something um, that stands out or something that is atypical. It's a natural variation, right? Um, what does neurodiversity spectrum actually mean? Neurodiversity spectrum refers to neuro-minority, which is 20% of the world, also neurodivergence, neurodiversity. And I can never resist, when I talk about neurodivergence, I can never resist sharing some names. You may have heard of um, Greta Thunberg, Albert Einstein, Justin Timberlake, Emma Thompson, and my favorite, my personal favorite, not the person, but the fact that Richard Branson calls out dyslexia as his super skill on his LinkedIn profile. And that's truly what neurodivergence brings. It is a super skill. If you get the right environment and the right enabled kind of conditions to actually thrive. And of course, 80% of the world is made, made up of folks that are neuro, that make up neuro majority or are neurotypical. So let's look into what the spectrum actually contains. And you may or may not have heard of some of these words. Dyslexia, which talks about difficulty in um, communicating in understanding spoken word, etc. Dyspraxia, which has to do with hand-eye coordination, and sometimes we do tend to label people as clumsy, maybe. Dyscalculia, which is difficulty in understanding math. And then, of course, the last two are probably the more well-known ones, which is attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, and autism. So all of these conditions do make up the neurodiversity spectrum. Let's jump into one deeper layer on what it is, what does it actually mean when we say neurotypical and neurodiverse. So what I'm showing here is a chart of neurotypical cognitive skills. And as you can see, most of the skills fall within this gray range there. There are variations there, 
but it does fall within an average score range and that's what a neuro majority or a neurotypical profile actually looks like. Let's now move on to what does a dyslexic cognitive profile look like. Now before I kind of go further, I do want to share a quote from Dr. Stephen Shore, which you may or may not have heard. When you meet one person with dyslexia, you've met one person with dyslexia. I think he used the word autism. When you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So what I'm sharing here is one, one dyslexic profile. You, we cannot kind of extrapolate that for every single person who may have dyslexia. And as you can see on the slide, for this individual, their spatial awareness is at 96th percentile, well above the average range while their verbal memory is on the 12th percentile, which is below the average range. And what does that actually mean? When we say spatial awareness, this is a person who is probably going to be good at problem solving, at math reasoning, at creating 3D models from abstract data. And yes, they may not be as good with verbal memory, recalling conversations, recalling facts, but we know we have enough technology available now to help us remind of conversations and facts, right? Which is why I said, if you give the right enabler and the right environment for the person to thrive, it is equalizing the profile for them. This profile is also sometimes called a cognitive profile, uh, a spiky profile. Okay, on the statistics, there are four of them there, but the two that I'm going to speak to are the first two, which is 16% of autistic adults are in full-time employment. Only 16%. And if you read that 16% number with reference to the one that follows, that says 43% of autistic individuals. So it's 43% of that 16% have actually left or lost a job because of lack of understanding and support. Mm -hmm. So it's honestly as simple as creating awareness at having more conversations and just bringing in those enablers that helps neurodivergent individuals to thrive. And I will talk more about that as well. But we always talk about what are the business benefits? Is neuro inclusion just a right thing to do, a moral thing to do, a good thing to do, or does it actually make business sense? And there is enough and more research about how it absolutely does make business sense. Uh, folks in neurodiversity in business, it's, a, it's an organization in UK, have done a research, and they have found from employers, employers concur, that when they focus on neuro inclusion, they have noticed 80% more hyper focus. They have noticed 78% more creative thinking, 75% more innovative thinking, detail processing, uh, authenticity in the place to work, so on and so forth. So yes, it absolutely does make business sense, provided you are giving the neurodivergent individuals the right environment to thrive. So what does this right environment look like? It is honestly as simple as reducing the ambiguity at the workplace. Literally, that's the one line or the one takeaway that I would love for all of you to walk away with. When you're assigning tasks to team members who may be neurodivergent, try and make it as clear as possible. Set very clear performance expectations, behavior expectations and goals. Plan, plan ahead. And honestly, I can speak to this even for my own daughter. If I have to travel for work, if there is going to be a change in her classroom schedule, if there is going to be any change in any routine for her, the sooner we tell her, the easier it is for her to cope with the change. Because I think in her mind, she's able to plan the whole thing a lot better. And we, pro we need to do the same thing at work as well. The next one is communicate with clarity. We do sometimes tend to use jargon, we use language may not be clear, where we're expecting somebody to read between the lines. Let's try and avoid that for somebody who may be neurodivergent. Spell out exactly what you're looking for and what you need. And the last one, the most important one, we are all unique and this goes for neurodivergent individuals as well who are unique in their own thinking and their own styles. So do always ask what the individual needs to work best. Don't assume. And that's the last one from me before you uh, hear from Matthew. This is what we are doing within AWS to make AWS more neuro-inclusive uh, for our builders. 
And why is it important for us to make, neuro, to make AWS more neuro-inclusive? It's because when our builders know the concept and they are aware of it, they are hopefully building solutions, technology, and platforms that have neural inclusion built in. So for me, it goes beyond just the employees. I'm hoping to serve the customers through this work as well. What we're focusing on is looking at, a, at our people processes, our talent management processes, our policies from a neuro-inclusive lens. We are, of course, looking at the way we hire. Um, is, our, is our job description clear? Does it have any read between the line elements in it? Uh, when we run the interview process, are we looking at um, how inclusive it is? Is there bright lights, loud sounds, which are not like this environment, for example? Probably not best for somebody who is neurodivergent. But can we influence that in our interview process such that we are setting the person up for success without lowering the hiring bar? That's what we need to focus on. Building manager's capability, I think I've already spoken about that. It not only improves neuro inclusion within AWS, but it influences the output of all of our builders. And lastly, yes, we have a community of inclusion ambassadors, 18,000 inclusion ambassadors across the globe, who are kind of our you know, eyes and ears on the ground to spread the word and amplify um, the learning awareness and initiatives around neuro inclusion. So that's a quick rush through from me. I'll now hand over to Matt for the rest of the presentation, but we will both be here once we are done with the talk in case you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manisha. Uh, my name's Matthew Milne. I lead our enterprise support teams up in the Canadian public sector. Um, this is a topic that's it's really personal for me. I, uh, I live in what I describe affectionately as a neurodiverse household. So my wife has had dyslexia, been diagnosed since high school. Uh, two of my sons are combined ASD and ADHD in the last two years, and almost one year to the day I was diagnosed with ADHD type I. So the last year I've been on a, a little bit of a journey, finding out more about neurodiversity, finding out more about tech and how it can help. And if I get a chance to be an advocate and have a sole voice to try and get promotion of this to take into the workplace, then I'm going to jump on that with two feet. So. Some housekeeping and some AI safety, so security is job zero at AWS. Some of the high level tech agnostic subjects I'm going to talk about today, check with your employer if they have a data AI strategy. We're talking about helping builders in the workplace and if there is sensitive information, PII data that should be kept within there, then adhere to those policies. And if you don't yet have a policy, there's many booths out here and AWS can certainly help with that. Um, we recommend Amazon Bedrock. Obviously, it's been talked about at length this week. I'm not going to dive into that, but that allows you secure within your own VPC. So how can generative AI help with executive function, for example? So a lot of these will be mirrored by how people are using AI today, but this is specifically for neurodiverse individuals. So clear and concise communication. In terms of first impressions, all of you made an impression of me within the first seven seconds. Psychologically, first impressions are made within seven seconds, and 55% of that is on visual. So if you are writing a document as a neurodiverse individual, and it has grammatical errors or spelling mistakes through no fault of your own, if you take that to a leader who has not much time, they may discount and they may discard ideas that your company can have. So we've had spell checkers for years and years and years, but generally I can build on that. You can, something we do at Amazon is you can attach that to your own writing style through retrieval augmented generation. So if you have company styles, fonts, ways of writing, you can attach that, you can have your document scanned and it will obviously adhere to that, catch any typos and grammar and hopefully not miss out on any ideas that may have been discarded because the document did not look complete. In terms of meeting summarization, I think we're all Zoom fatigued over the last few years. Um, you can bounce from one meeting to another, and something that is executive dysfunction is forgetting things. So you were in an important meeting, you made a promise to a colleague or to a customer, now you can't remember what that was. So using AI to generate a summary, capture actions, have an email automatically to everyone else can help just purely by just installing it and having that running alongside your meeting. Planning and scheduling. <laughs> I, uh, yesterday I managed to get to the elevator without my reInvent badge, had to go back. 
When I got to the elevator the second time, I realized I didn't have my contact lens and I couldn't see. So like, the execute function for planning and scheduling is real. Having that break down tasks, there's time blindness is something that your diverse individuals can adhere to. Breaking down tasks, making things easier, allowing you to get work done on time and not miss deadlines. So if we're talking about that in terms of prompts, I'm not going to dive into each of these any, and they're very 100 level prompts. These are some of the ways that which could you have a chatbot to help with some of these. So clear clients communication, maintenance summarization, and planning and scheduling. Another topic as well which I can help with, um, there's a, a terminology called rejection sensitive dysphoria that neurodiverse individuals can have. It's not a clinical term, it's being studied as we speak just now, but feedback can be taken the wrong way or be overthought by a neurodiverse individual. Um, yeah, having an AI sort of peer review or, or look through some of the tone or the messages or feedback you've received can actually soften some of the blow if it is constructive feedback. So using it as like a peer review for some of that really helps. And in terms of imposter syndrome, again, I think most people encounter imposter syndrome, but again, it's with this black and white thinking, with this rejection sensitivity, it is really prevalent within neurodiverse individuals. So helping obviously validate an idea, validate a technical document, a technical design, these things can be leveraged to help with that. Again, high level prompts. How would you utilize a chatbot to, to get some of them? One of the things we do at Amazon, I've got a, a demo here of one of our builders who had a CloudFormation template. They wanted to peer review that before sharing it with their peers. So the chatbot can be trained on things like the well-architected framework review and the pillars for security, risk, operations. Review the document. It'll spit out suggestions. It will complement where it works if it's highly resilient, things like that. It will reference documentation where you can make it better. And then also share documents that you can share with others. So within a few mouse clicks, something that maybe they were afraid to share, maybe afraid to demo, but the idea was right. They can have that validated by sources that we know is good. For example, AWS Well-Architected Framework. So yeah, this is some of the ways we're using it internally. And, and again, part of this talk is to allow all of you to go away and, and, and replicate this and, and see how we can help. All right, so doing well for time. It's a lightning talk. I had to squeeze so much in for here to get this here. So I apologize for the speed. So some takeaways. Neurodiversity is a competitive advantage and can be supported by Gen AI ensure it adheres to appropriate safeguards. That is the one thing I wanted to take away. Neurodiverse individuals without support and inclusion may not reach their full potential. So Manisha statistics of 16% of autistic adults not in employment, sorry, only in employment, and the 43% um, that have lost a job because of lack of support. If my voice, if all of our voices to advocate for that can get those numbers up or down, I consider that a win, especially knowing the future generations that come behind. And lastly, the question I pose to all of you, how can you advocate for and implement AI tools that specifically support neurodiverse builders in your workplace? Leave that to sit. Some links just to take away. Uh, obviously, Amazon launched Amazon Nova, one of our own generation models this week. I hope you all heard about that. Amazon Bedrock foundation that we build on, and Amazon Party Rock, which is a, a ready to rock, ready to go uh, offering that AWS have. Uh, the bottom one again, if anyone would like to connect, uh, obviously trying to build a community of people who are in this space and, and talk about AI for neurodiversity. That is us, I managed to finish on time. Um, thank you so much all for your time, and I really hope you enjoy the rest of your reInvent. <laughs>